How glad I was when I heard I've been invited back here. And I'm just glad that Stephen sometimes has a holiday because who would choose me if you had Stephen all the time? But oh, it's just great to be here. I noticed that about half of what were here the last time I was here, so obviously word got around that I was coming back. <laughs> Don't worry, as long as I get the one that God was aiming for, it might be one, it might be two, I don't care. And I feel that I've got a message from the Lord and I'm not going to miss on that truth. By the way, Phil was getting at me earlier on, so he's going to do the reading for me after I finish telling you a couple of little stories. And he's going to volunteer, he's going to smile as he does so, and he's going to read from Genesis 41, 38 to 50. I don't normally give warnings as long as this, but I am since I'm feeling in a good mood tonight. And then also just... Genesis 50, verse 20. A little bit from the story of Joseph and then that key verse that comes throughout his whole life story. Genesis 41, 38 to 50. The rest of you don't need to look it up. I want you to listen to my stories. But Phil needs to know, so I'm giving him the warning. And then 50, verse 20. Some of the little stories, it was Stephen that came and said, oh, you've got to tell some of these stories to the folk in Lock Brickland. I mean, I told you a little bit of a testimony. You got some of the stories. But... I've been praying about what I should do, what I should say and all the rest. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing. Just summarize very, very quickly. Some answers to prayer. I know Jim wanted to know how did the mission go. And I want to thank you for praying for us. Every night there was the consciousness that this meeting has been bathed in prayer and that God was speaking to hearts. Only one night when it was bucketing did we have, well two nights we had 32 cars, but only one night did we have no unsaved in at all. And from 32 right up to 70. And it was lovely. Just outside Monaghan. And oh, it was great. I didn't see the break that I wanted. But like I saw in Stewartstown, I was directed to go to the lady that says the hardest lady in the country. <laughs> well, I, ended, I was actually told by her son, if you even last 15 seconds on her door, you're doing better than most other ministers. She loves throwing ministers out. <laughs> and uh, I went to see her, and it was actually very nice. I was welcomed in, prayed for her daughter, who fortunately had a broken leg, and it gave me an excuse to stay longer. <laughs> I'm not merciless, it just happened that way. <laughs> then I talked to her about the mission she needed to come and do her good knowledge, and she asked me, what do you think? You think I need saved? What makes you think that? I said, your mouth. <laughs> I am trying to be tactful, but it's hard sometimes. And um, anyway, we talked on and I said, are you coming? She said, no. She said, but if you go to another lady on the other side of the village and she agrees to go, then I'll go. Long story short, I went. She wasn't there. I went back. She was there. She said, okay, I'll go. I went running back to save time. I went bursting through the front door to see her, you know, a battle axe, like you don't want to bring her to the door twice. <laughs> and she could too. And I didn't know she'd put these blinds down <laughs> all the way across the door. <laughs> and I tore not only the blinds down, but the whole thing off the roof. <laughs> if there's a way of doing it right and a way of doing it not right, guess which one I'll choose. And she came through that door, I think, faster than anything she's done in the last 30 years. <laughs> And then tried to fix it, she couldn't. I reached in, fixed it a little bit, and then I told her, I'll come back tomorrow morning and I'll sort it. When I left that night, I got a hug from that lady. And she came to the mission four times. (laughs) Sometimes God's just amazing. No matter how awkward we make it for him, he's just great. And so this time, I had another lady down in Monaghan. And our first meeting with her around the doors, we did door visiting almost every day, except for the last day of the mission, we went visiting on the doors. And the opportunities were amazing. Going into Roman Catholic families and simply sharing with them the Lord Jesus, telling them about the message of the gospel, sharing with those who still think they have to buy their way or suffer their way or light their candles and all this garbage. And so as I talked with one of my ladies, her daughter of 48 died of cancer. 
And when I told her that we are going through a battle at the minute with my son, who's only 45, she said, oh, I know. And then she said, my husband actually died in the Mass. And so I said, would you like me to pray? She said, oh, I would love it. And just to pray and explain to her, you don't have to pay anything. Jesus has paid it all. And so night by night we had blessings. And then I met the hardest woman around that area. <laughs> I collect them, don't I? This is not an inflection of my wife called Wilma. <laughs> but she is the only missionary woman I've ever known to have carried a knife in her hand. No, actually, my mother-in-law did the same when they were practicing us against gangs of mafia thugs. And they were not going to let anybody, if they, we went down, she were, her and her mother were not going to let them into our kids and all the rest of it. And I love that. I'm not a pacifistic missionary, you might learn over the time of stories, but my work, I would have done probably a quarter of what we've seen done if Wilma wasn't there. And so, anyway, and certainly the teams wouldn't be so enthusiastic about coming out, but her cooking is second to none. And I throw that challenge to anybody. (laughs) And so when I went to this lady, I was with another dear old friend and he, she said, I've never met a minister or a preacher in my life that I agreed with. I said, oh, that's good. I prefer antagonism to indifference any day. She said, what? <laughs> Big word sometimes, baffle. I didn't baffle her. And then she said, I said, are you coming to me? She said, oh, I'll be there. She was there every single night. And she said, and if I hear anything I don't agree with, I'll tell you. And I said, bring it on. <laughs> and so it was awesome. And she talked to me a couple of, three times there was something just not ringing right and I said look I'm really burdened by this I would like you to come over and talk with Wilma and myself tomorrow morning and she wondered what on earth does he want me to go over and talk to him about and so she talked with her brother who brought her over and then we talked and turned out she had been up to the eyeballs and Armstrong is a a cult that's very big over many parts of the world and he was fleecing millions of people travelling all over the world in his big jet plane and others I said, do you realise you were with the cult? She said, I know it now. And then so many years lost, wandering, had been a professing Christian. And because she married a guy in this place that she thought was a Christian, turned out it wasn't true at all. And so brought her to a place where we prayed regarding these things. And she said, I can't pray. I've never prayed. I said, you're going to pray now. And she did. And she renounced all of these things including all of those wasted years with her husband. And then oh, the next day, another lovely old lady went to talk with her and said, let's go for a walk. And then they stopped over this field where there were calves and others were running around. And she leaned over and said, what's going on? She said, now we're going to pray. And the old lady prayed. And then Annie and this lady, Eva came to me after. She said, I couldn't get her stopped. She just told the Lord how wonderful it was to get rid of that old burden. And she just went on and on. And when she told me that night, I said, see, I told you. That's what it's like when you're part of the family. And she was the only one that really had the breakthrough. But I believe there's so much more. Mm -hmm. But I have the horrible feeling, too, (coughs) that there are those that listened. who, If they don't make a move, there's going to be tragic. Uh, events following. I've seen it so many times. But so that was the mission regarding going to Greece and all the rest of it. That was a blessed time. I haven't time to even touch a quarter of it. But one really exciting thing happened. I went to a meeting one night and I was just going through the door and going, change the meeting, change the message. I said, oh no, not again. I hate that. And yet, you know, you've got to do it. And so I did. And I hadn't hardly finished and this young man, nearly 40, came running up from Cyprus. He said, every line of that was for me. And so we prayed together, got the situation dealt with. And I was just walking out through the door, thinking in my head, I've got a service tomorrow morning. I've got it all the way home, and then I've got to go to Beria, you know, Acts 17. I was preaching there the next morning. And this week, I've known her since she was a little taught about nine. She used to come to my meetings. And she would come to the young people's meetings. And then when the older people come, she would go in with her little friend and sit all the way through three and a half to four hours of torment. <laughs> but she loved it. And she came over and said, David, I just want to know, can I pray for you? And I said, you can pray for me anytime. And she just put her hand on my shoulder 
took my other hand and she only first year in university. And she asked the Lord to undertake for me. Thank you for the meeting tonight. Thank you for all who's been there for. And then bless him tomorrow. Help him to have a message from you. Next morning in the church. Message changed just so when <laughs> it was <laughs> not again. And then the Lord just took over. Wilma was sitting down in the congregation. Not this Wilma, that Wilma. And uh, a lady sitting beside her, we'd never seen her in our lives before. And she was nudging Wilma going, that was for me, that was for me, that was for me. As soon as I closed the meeting up, she came running to the front of the church, crying her eyes out and fell on her knees. Give her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She had one time followed the Lord Jesus, but church had split many years earlier. She went off and she went into dark, dark, dark ways. And this day, just back with the Lord. And for me, that was just awesome. We visited more than 530 people. And that was with my calendars. Because when I'm there, the speaking voice keeps on going to them. There, We have hundreds of people that long for us every year to come and talk with them, share with them about Jesus, and give them the calendars that they can hear the truth or read the truth throughout the year. So that was great. Our mission was great. We did all the visiting down here in Mon, and I would say this, the Catholic people down here are getting more right than they have ever been before. I had someone with me, and he was a little bit nervous. I do the same as I started church at, uh, in Stewartstown. I, which is, where's the most Republican here in this place? <laughs> you start out there, and then the rest is dead easy. And this man is <laughs> sure about this. And the next day he said, can we go back there? And then the third day as well. We had a crowd one day of up to 15 people standing around us, firing questions. You'd have thought it was an open air meeting. Uh-huh. And we were there for nearly 40 minutes. Uh-huh. And I mean, broken toys, broken windows, broken doors, furniture all the way down the path. You can guess the kind of place it was. It was fantastic. And the openings were good. They insulted us because we were there. They thought like Jehovah's Witness. I don't know in no uncertain terms. I wasn't one of those boys. And then they came back again. And so they just left themselves open to a slight retaliatory comment. And I'm learning with Phil and all these boys coming out how to defend myself. Plus I've married a Highlander. <laughs> and the boy said, you don't mind that you don't really worry about insulting a man in his own garden, do you? I said, not a bit. <laughs> Broke the ice and they all started gathering around us. It was amazing. Asking questions, the difference in Catholics and Protestants. What does it mean to really become a Christian? The question just went on and went on and went on. And so, I know you are praying, and we could feel it every single day, and I thank you for that. The work that we're doing in Greece, very quickly for our young friend who's coming out to visit us, it was lovely to get that promise from him tonight. (laughs) I'm an optimist, you see. Uh, We started working in Eastern Europe many years ago, and we were taking Bibles, some other things, medical aid, clothes, food, to the people behind the Iron Curtain who were being, when they were arrested, tortured, put in prison, and some of them died. Our job was to go and bring encouragement to them. Then we worked on the war fronts of Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and watched God protecting as we delivered all that time. Then we went for two years of study. We actually nearly broke down at that time. It was a difficult time. We saw things that nobody, especially missionaries, should ever see. And our kids were nearly always with us. And then we went for two years study to the States. Loved it. Came back and God redirected us to Greece and to Macedonia. How that all worked out was quite amazing. And we've been there ever since watching God do amazing things both in both those countries. Preaching in little churches. And then we were there pretty well set up and organized when there were the influx of Muslim people came in 2015 we were there, we were actually reaching them when they were coming into Macedonia before the Greeks were even aware of all these crowds of people coming through in their ones, twos and dozens and then as they gathered up and became thousands just inside Macedonia well then it started becoming a major problem and then they were stopped they were not allowed to go through and then as they built up in their tens of thousands in Greece we started working full time with those and it was an amazing blessing we had to we had already started working building a youth camp and that's where Phil and his friends have all come out working with us and then 
we concentrated on reaching these refugees. And how God blessed to see Muslim refugees coming and just asking, can you show me how to become a Christian? Missionaries beg for the like that. We've had it time and time again. Right up to one night when four Muslim men came up. I said, can you show me how to become a Christian? Can you? Sh-? And I, I thought it was a scam. There's no way. This is not genuine. So I started putting a couple of testers out. And broken hearted stories coming out. And I led over four to Jesus that night. Yeah. My friend Yanni that I'd been mentoring led two other men to the Lord that same night. It's just been amazing. So lots of things happened throughout all the time we've been there. The camp is pretty well close to finishing just now. And we've got three more teams coming out from the 18th of September onwards. And so we'll be glad for the extra additional help, skill, and all that you've learned in all of these different jobs. And I thank you for sharing that with <laughs> Anyway, so... No I felt, there's no pressure at all, <laughs> none at all. I will find out some place where you live. <laughs> We've all been praying for Ukraine. And it's touched our hearts deeply because we worked in many different parts of Ukraine. And I felt tonight I would share with you a couple of little stories on how God helped us and made us see that he was still on the throne. When we were there, communism had actually just fallen. And it was sort of tense times. We were going in to give out 180,000 gospel booklets. We had some Baptists and some Pentecostals. We blended them all together, went out and gave the whole lot out. It was brilliant. We got a chance of going to university. We wondered, should we sort of tiptoe around this and be... No, just tell the truth like it is. Jesus died for you and you can conceive. You can know what it is to have sins forgiven and all this stuff. Straight in, gospel story. <clears throat> One of the lecturers, he was so taken. The wee girls were different. They were trying to think of a way how they get out of Ukraine come to the West. All sorts of offers were on the market, but this lecturer came with his 16-year-old son on the third night, on his knees, on the ground, outside the hall. Committed, both of them committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, it was just brilliant. One day we went to a market. This lady suddenly materialized right in front of Wilma. And her arms going all over the place. I thought that's a wee Pentecostal or something. <laughs> if she had come to any other woman, no one had a clue what was happening. But Wilma does sign language. She understood what the lady was asking. Her. Who are you and what are you doing here? So she started explaining that we were Christians. We loved Jesus Christ and we're coming to tell you. The lady burst into tears. That normally happens when I speak. <laughs> and so she was like, what on earth? Going, What's wrong? And then the wee lady said, because I was deaf. They put me in an orphanage. And I grew up in the orphanage and one day I heard some of the other, you know, reading the sign language, someone mentioning the name Jesus Christ. So she went to the director. He's the one with all the answers. Who's Jesus Christ? And he took her into the office. He took her to a horse whip and he beat her within an inch of her life. He said, don't you ever mention that name again. And she said, I never mentioned that name until right now. And when I had the chance of telling her about Jesus and why Jesus came, why he died, how he rose again, he paid the price for our sin, and we could have a relationship with God through him. Simple. And that wee lady was just so touched. I also think she was crying nearly all the way through. Terrible sermon to listen to. But she went into a marketplace, and all she could afford was a little broken plastic thing with wisdom strawberries. And she bought that and brought it back to us to say thank you. Never forget it. And then one night I was going down to a midweek meeting. And when I got there I thought, what on earth? They obviously don't know I'm coming. The, ho- the house was packed right out through the whole back door, the whole backyard. Packed hundreds of people. And I was pushed, 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 pushed right through it, and then suddenly I was stopped. I couldn't go any further. Sort of darkened little home. They didn't have the look of this. No, I don't even dream of that. And I looked down, and there's a coffin right in front of me. Look at the coffin. There's a Russian soldier. Now, if you're in Ukraine right now, and a dead Russian soldier is found in your room, you're going to have questions answered. Back then, it was exactly the same. And I said to my interpreter, hey, Bill, what's going on here? So he whispered and asked some questions and 
the answer came back. Misha, who lives in this home, drowned yesterday. Because the whole family are Christians. They are using this wake as an opportunity to reach the whole neighbourhood with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly this man came up to me and turned out it was the, we, Misha's father. And he says, see you have a camera. Will you take some photographs? And I want photographs of Misha. None of us have a camera. First time in my life I ever did the like that's kind of morbid. And as I was doing that, I said, Lord, please give me a message. Please give me a message. Here I'm asking the Lord, give me a message suddenly, but I normally don't like it at all. And God came down. That message, everything about it, just God taking over. I don't recommend it. I don't like these preachers that think, I just go, God will just use me and think. No, he doesn't like it. He wants you to spend time reading his word, getting into it, and then when he gives you something, then you share it. But sometimes a lot of that is for you, and then he can give you something else suddenly if he needs to. And it was amazing. The father came up to me afterwards, and he just grabbed hold of him, and he kissed me on the sheet three times, crying his eyes out. And he said, will you come to my, tomorrow and speak at my son's funeral? And I, not a moment, I said, of course, this is what missionaries dream about. Of course I'll be here. Good. Look around, was on the, I'm 200 kilometers away tomorrow. Who is going to translate for you? I don't worry about little issues like that. I've got an opportunity to preach. And we're just standing, I wonder what's going to happen tomorrow then. And suddenly this wee lady in grey suit, white hat, comes walking across. She said, do you need a translator? And she spoke in really nice English. And she said, I was actually living 200 kilometres. And I came to see my friend who lives just beside Misha's family. And they were coming here tonight because of this tragedy. So I just came along. But if you want me. And then she said, oh, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I said, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, the, the God just steps in. You know, mm-hmm. Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all your needs. That's <laughs> all in capital letters. Huh. And that night I started to prepare beside Betty with the man. I disturbed her nearly every time I'm going to be preaching. She never gets a good night's sleep whenever I'm going to be preaching. And she's the most sleepless missionary I know. Uh-huh. <laughs> but the night I was up nearly the whole night. The next day at the grave. The sense of God's presence was amazing. This young soldier had his fiance. She was there. She would never be with him again. Her, his, bo- his brother was there. And they both spoke of what it was like to have Misha as a brother, as a Christian, his faithfulness to Jesus. And then I preached. And God came down. I've had lovely translators. I have an intelligence translator. I have had a professional translator that tried to translate for me once in Thessalonica. Ten minutes later she said, I can't take any more of them. She ran out. <laughs> I've had it all. You name it, I've had it. That day, as I spoke, it flew and out through that lady like nothing I've ever experienced anywhere. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And when it was all over, I went over to her and I said, how on earth was that even possible? He says, David, I was taught English by an Irishman 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's what God can do. He is simply awesome. It's not my work. It's not Wilma's work. We enjoy the wee bit of it that we can do. But it's his work. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I could keep you here a day and a night without even losing breath. Because the things that God has done over these years. And just recently, our son Alan actually was in Ukraine. He was he works with a group called World Help. He is the only son that we have who's not married. He said a woman needs time and money, and he is neither. <laughs> so he travels the world, he finds a crisis like a war or a volcano or a tsunami or an earthquake. Or, yeah, all sorts of situations. Little children in Thailand and India getting taken at two years, being trained to be prostitutes, male and female, rescuing them, putting them into homes, going to other countries where they dig wells so that they can just survive. It's not easy. And he was in Ukraine. He actually told us he was going to... 
First of all, Poland, and then Romania. I said, well, now that rascal's going to go to Ukraine. I'm telling Phoned up the next day. So, by the way, I'm in Ukraine. <laughs> He's just like his mother. And so, it, he was just leaving. And this man, who owned a very big firm, contacted them and said, we've felt that, we've watched what you've done, we've supported you over the past years, but we feel, regarding your helping in Ukraine, we should give you a million dollars. And uh, when Alan heard all this, he contacted the man and he said, we are actually not sending a million dollars out. I'm actually getting a team and going out to Ukraine. And we're going to Poland, we're going to uh, Romania, and we'll be working in Ukraine as well. And the man says, well, I'm not sending a million dollars. I'm sending you $1.6 million. Wow. Because of the years of trust that he has been building up, they know who he is, what he can do. I thought, that's my boy. <laughs> And so they were helping set up camps for the people to go to and helping those that are bringing them out. Because when the men are working in the front lines, there's millions of girls and young women that will be targeted. And we've been working in war fronts for so many years, we know what's going on. And we've met many of them outside of the country now, and they they want to go back. Their men are fighting for their country against that thug coming from Moscow and I said we've got one side <laughs> well it's we have to fight against something that's wrong, it's as simple as that when we stop fighting as someone said a long time ago all it needs for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing and you need to stand up sometimes and be counted okay. and then he went back there just a few weeks ago, this time he wasn't in because he had brought several other people with him, and several of them were ladies, and the husband said, don't you dare bring my wife inside Ukraine, okay? And so then there, that's going to be a way of establishing routes for a lot more funding to go to help the groups that they've already set up. So lots and lots of things happening on every front. Now I'm going to do something I've never done in my life before. I've got another lady in this congregation called Wilma. I normally take orders from a different one. But this one is going to give me a number and based on her number, no, two numbers I think she's going to give me, I'm going to tell you another story. So I have no idea what she's going to ask. I was praying about this two nights ago and I said, that's so crazy, this has to be from the Lord. <laughs> well, let's go. What was the number between one and one? One and seventy, okay. and then one to nine. Okay, first one I'm going to say sixty-nine. Right to the limit. Well done. And do you want the next one? No, I'm going to guess. <laughs> of course I want the next one. <laughs> I didn't know who wanted it. I already. <laughs> right, the next one's one. Oops. Well, this was at a special place. And actually, it was at a big conference in Northern Ireland. Hundreds of people. And we were in this big school building. And suddenly I was just getting ready to preach. And suddenly, <laughs> whole hallway disintegrated. Methane gas <laughs> had exploded. I didn't know it did that. And it blew the whole corridor completely out of the school. And hundreds of it had to abandon the whole place and go and stay the night in a nearby playing ground. That was just one of them. They haven't learned a lesson. I was preaching this week for the same group of people and they said we want you to give a report and we want you to preach and you've got five minutes. Hmm. This time there was no explosion. I just multiplied the five by another five. (laughs) I said I'm not travelling all this distance to give you a sermonette. Sermonettes make Christianettes and I don't... (laughs) Well, said I've never even heard that word before. I don't really care, but you got the message. And so, I don't know what the Lord will do with it the next time if this sort of nonsense carries on. But anyway, I still go back. There's a lot of people amongst them that still pray for us, and we are grateful. But it's interesting. That was just, one I expected you to pick any other country, but you had to pick one little one from Ireland. Pick somebody and they'll give me another number. What do you mean, pick somebody? Pick somebody. 
Somebody you like or somebody you don't like. I don't care. Uh, but Emma Jane. <laughs> Emma Jane's going to get my wee leprechaun. She encouraged me tonight with what she said yeah. about somebody being with Joshua. That's basically the keynote of my message. His faithfulness. Come on. Well, that's right. What between one and seven? Between one and seventy, and then to fi- define it between one and nine. Um, twenty-three and five. Eight. Twenty-eight. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing practice my sums. I was never good at sums. <laughs> okay. We've been in a house and I've got a lifelong contract. This is in Austria when we're travelling in out of Eastern Europe and into the war fields of Yugoslavia. And suddenly the landlord decides that we are getting out. And I said, there's no way. There is no way. And I said, I've got a lifelong contract. He's not putting me out. Contact the mission. The mission said, you're getting out. <laughs> we don't want you to fight about anything. Just go and all the rest of it. And he actually told me I should cut down loads and loads of trees in his garden. So he used that as grounds for telling the authorities, this man's cutting all the trees down in my property. I need him out. Actually, all he wanted was that his son could live in the house that we'd renovated. And so we got out, but not before. I said, I'm not leaving without seeing him. Every time I went to his house, he was not there. He would not answer the phone. He would not do anything. And so this day I happened to be driving a different part of our village and I saw him out walking this little doggy. And I went, he saw me and then he, that poor wee dog was dragged along his whole bottom, was raped, ripped raw. And so I went up to him and I told him he was a cowardly so-and-so, but that I was still going to be praying for him. And we lost the house, but we got a better one. And it's just one of those things. There's something about me that if somebody tries to make me do something, <laughs> sort of grit the teeth and I wonder about that but at least I got a chance of sharing with him and wasn't my finest moment I've got to admit but it was one of those it was a difficult time especially for Wilma we had done so much renovating and the whole house and all this lifelong contracts don't really mean lifelong contracts if you've got a Christian mission that believes you should do the right thing and be peaceful about it all the time anyway that was what you picked. And so I thought I could pick something and let you know just how awesome God is to us, what he's done and all this. And I thought I'll just leave it like this. Maybe you can learn something from some of my mistakes, whatever, but I don't regret doing it that way. Although I never in a million years would have dreamt that either of those two stories would have been picked. We'll leave it with God. The other message I'm going to leave, the message I'm going to leave with you is this little reading in Genesis. You ready, Phil? Yeah. What time do you normally close at? No. Why? <laughs> Has anybody got an urgent life or death appointment inside the next... Thank you. Love you. Jim, hold on to her. You're coming forward. Everybody else is going to stand. All over each year, one of the things I've always loved is when the Word of God has been read... We stand to show that we believe it is God's word. Because we lose track with us there. Genesis 41. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we. Hold on, verse 38 if you're following on, because what you read as well as listen, you will remember much better than what you don't. So, we don't have it up there, so let's see it. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And when he, and he had him ride in his second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. 
Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Sephnaphana, and he gave him a wife, Aseleth, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. That'll leave you now, brother. I'd like you have a wee bit of mercy. And then just the one verse from Genesis 15, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Amen. Thank you, Beth. This little story, every time I read Joseph, it sends shivers up my spine. He's the one person I would say in the Old Testament who is so much like Jesus in the things that he's now admittedly telling his brothers, one day you lot are going to bow down. That's not really the kind of thing you do to win friends and influence people, especially if you've got big brothers. And so apart from that little misdemeanor and then worsening it by saying oh and mum and dad you're going to do the same and yeah but we all learn quite if you knew some of the things that I've done as an immature Christian my wife's still waiting for me to get mature by the way um, but it's exciting learning all of these different things there's something about this young man and I actually do you know that we verses it alas master for it was borrowed that's what my theme is it's borrowed I read a book once by Alan Redpath, The Making of a Man of God. It's about the life of David. Incredible book. Absolutely incredible. And I just thought, this here, when I look at Joseph's story, it's the making of a man of God. And right through from he was a young man, in all the different things, even the little mistakes that he made, making his brothers detest him, going out, seeing what they were doing, and then clashing on them. They hated him. And the fact that there were four mothers involved in the family probably didn't make it any less dysfunctional. And so this is where he's at. But you see in looking at his story that God is working all the way through. It is an incredible story. I was trying to... I have so many sermons and so many places I've spoken in over the years. And I said, Lord, can I do... No back to Joseph every single time and although some of you ladies may think this is for Joseph it's not Josephine look this what God does for Joseph God can speak to you challenge you in exactly the same way and show you I can take you and use you don't give up no matter what you've gone through and I mean this man in all the things that faced him he could have just thrown in the towel and said no I've had enough and I have talked brokenheartedly with people many times. I've been 48 years now in the ministry. And many times I've talked with people that have suffered, really suffered. And they've turned their back on God. And if they just pressed through, they could have brought themselves or got themselves into a large place with him. And watched or could have seen something amazing. But instead of that... They've been walking in cold bypath meadows, some of them in the depths of sin and depravity because they turned their back on God. There is no limits to the way we will go when we turn back from Jesus. I know I've listened to people say, no, 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 that won't happen. We're civilized, we're relatively pleasant, reasonably educated, and a load of garbage. I have seen them, I have listened to their stories. I've wept with them, I've prayed with them, and some of them would appall you. And, like I said again, there are no limits to how far we will go when we turn our back on Jesus. If you look at him, you'll find that God allows him to go through probably around 15 years of hardship, and then his start, life started changing around but you can see in looking at his life, 
The kind of things that God allows. And that little thing that came out, out of every single one of those hymns, incidentally, is there any way that you could sort of tape some of your, we tape, you don't do it anymore, put it on a CD or something, put some of your songs all together and send them to me, that when we are driving our hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles, I can listen to you and think of you. I was blessed in every single song tonight, and I know you can do it even better with other ones, so put some of them together, or a few of them together, send them out. And I had someone who was recommending this, some person called Adele a few years ago, <laughs> and I was listening to one of my Irish fellowships singing their, you know, to do songs, we old hymns, and he said, hey, can I put Adele on? After three songs, I said, <laughs> put the other guys back. <laughs> Millions and millions of people love her. I said, that's okay. But I've had enough. I've had enough. The only fellowship. My son nearly fainted. He thought this is love. Anyway, that's what I love. And if you do that, I will be very, very, very grateful. Plus, I'll be thinking of some of you when I want to do it. <laughs> Lessons to learn. That obedience will not always be immediately rewarded. That God's timing doesn't need to coincide with ours. That suffering doesn't mean that God doesn't care. Need to learn. That accusations of evil don't mean you're out of God's will. You want to list some, here's one of the ones that they list against me. It's interesting. When I'm forgotten about, it doesn't mean that God has a faulty memory. God does work in the affairs of men. I said that he's one of the People of scripture who most resembles Jesus. If you look at some of the things that say about he was hated. If any of you have any interest in some of these texts I can give you. But you can find them in your own concordance. He was ridiculed. He was plotted against. He was stripped of his robe. He was sold for silver. He was taken to Egypt. He was lied about. And he was placed in captivity between two guilty men. And he was unrecognized by his own. Just... That's just at a glance. There's many other things as well. He's just an amazing little study. His biography is the kind of thing that filmmakers dream about. You look at him, the prejudice at the beginning, the pit, the prison, the palace. Wow, what a story you can make out of that. I remember seeing one little movie about uh, Egypt. It was Moses coming down generations later <coughs> years later anyway and they've got these little character figures going around and they were saying you're playing with a big boy now and I thought that's awesome there's these idiots with their little bit of magic and they thought they were going to turn God's servant around and show him and expose him boy I thought this is going to be great and it was and so here we see this man just in the midst of all that he suffered, proving God over and over again. And he didn't have the Holy Ghost living inside him like we have. The Holy Spirit came upon people for special tasks in the Old Testament. But we've got him living inside us. Do you know that he's living inside you? That you've got the power of God. I listen to people talking sometimes with ordinary Christians. I, You're not an ordinary Christian. It's impossible. If God's living inside you, you're no longer ordinary. Even if you're wearing a green cardigan. <laughs> she picked on me at Georgetown last time. She used to come up and annoy me, and I loved it. But I do intend to get my own back. Every step of the way, from his brother's dream, from his brother's being mentioned in his dreams to his family, yeah, begging for trouble, but that was setting in the grounds for the hatred that would make them take him and sell him off. In fact, what they planned on doing was actually murdering him. And then Reuben, the big brother, said, nah, nah, let's not do that. Let's just put him in a pit. Okay, if he's going to starve to death, that's fine. And so they were happy enough that Reuben goes off intending to come back and release him. Midianites come around and said, hey, let's make some profit out of this guy. And 30 pieces of silver was the going rate. I think those Midianites were used to bargaining, so they said, we'll give you 20 for him. They probably thought he's probably, he looks a bit like them or something. And 
They said, okay, 20 is better than nothing, so Joseph went off. It was, it was hard. It really was hard. You can imagine him being tied on the back of a donkey or a camel or whatever it was the, con- the train was off. Betrayed, bewildered, hurt to the point of insanity. How could my brothers do? I know I clashed, but that they would do this to me. And it was horrendous. But if you think of this man, Joseph, suffering like this, you would think, why should this happen to me? The number of times I've talked to Christians and they've said, why did the Lord allow that to happen to me? If you know Jesus, why should it not happen to you? Because you've got the power of Christ in your life. You've got the Holy Ghost living inside you. And you can show a world in darkness and sin what you can go through with Jesus that would be impossible for anybody else without him. If you find it difficult to accept what I've just said, I'm going to recommend a little book to you. In fact, I'm going to recommend two. A man called Paul E. Billheimer, Pentecostal writer. But boy, he has his stuff together. He talks about suffering in the lives of the believers and how God allows it because he's training us not just for the 70 years that we might live or whatever few years extra but he's preparing us for eternity. It will change your whole perspective on why you go through rough things. The first book he wrote was called Destined for the Throne. It is amazing. And the next one he wrote was simply called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Don't whinge and whine and cry about them. Go through, help others that are going through the same thing and let them see what you can accomplish with Jesus even when your heart is breaking. We've had a difficult time when the over this last few months with our son Brian, only 45, going through cancer. Having the operation, at least there's no cancer. Didn't even take lymph nodes to check it. And four days later the prognosis came back. That was the worst kind of cancer that he could have. And telling us that maybe another operation would have to be done and then on and on. And every time he took a step forward, he went a step back again. And that wee boy that prayed for my mum when he was three and a half. And God healed her just like that. When he was 16, he came with a baseball bat to protect his daddy who was against 14 mafia thugs with their baseball bats. And he jumped in the middle of that. He was going to protect his daddy. When it came to protecting little girls in school or his brothers, he was always there. He has been amazing. When he was 11, he pointed his little five-year-old brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these memories just pour through you when you're thinking, our son. And then he starts making progress. The chemo comes and he's several days of agony every two weeks. And that's not easy. I'm a bad father and I feel it all the time. I wish it was me, but he said, Dad, you couldn't take this. (laughs) You're just an old guy now. But I don't know what he means. But the thing is, not once in all of these months has he had one drop of nausea? He says, I can take the pain, but I couldn't take the nausea. And thank everybody you know that's praying for me. So I'm thanking you in his name. And he was supposed to come over this week to us with his seven kids. His wife left him some years ago. She turned her back on Jesus and she wanted a bit more fun in life. It's been difficult. And now these years later, he's going this way. And it's not easy. He still loves her with all of his heart and last Tuesday, Tuesday two weeks ago it turned out his white blood coming right down and they said you're not going to Ireland you're staying and he was well not only disappointed he was actually angry it, two weeks earlier oh you can definitely go to Ireland this is great and all the rest of suddenly he's not coming last Tuesday two weeks ago it was hard for me it was really difficult William said we're trusting, we're trusting, we've taken it to the Lord, let's, 
By the next morning, I was back on my feet again. It was okay. The Lord understands when you have a hard time. He doesn't want you to go around with a real stupid grin in your face all the time because then people think you're mental. But sometimes it's hard. He's had a few days off with his kids and he's back home now. And he's getting ready for the next dose of chemo this Tuesday. <coughs> two days, every two weeks, for six months. And he's almost at the halfway mark. They've already told him this one coming will probably be the worst one that he's ever gone through. I'm still shuddering for it. I know God's with him. He's helping him. His old boss is going through exactly the same cancer. And Brian had tried to witness to him and just couldn't get anywhere. And then he started coming with Brian to church. Now, this man has gone all over the States and now he's living within a mile of my son. This is God's work. And he said, but Brian, I'm too evil. There's no way that God could ever save me. And Brian's getting through to him because they're fighting the same thing. Only this man has been told, all we can do is make you comfortable. We can't stop this thing. So Brian is desperately trying to reach him before it's too late. Whenever the the boys had sold their brother off, they came back with a blood-soaked coat. It reminded me of the first coat that my wife had been sent to. A lovely, lovely fur coat. First time she wore it, I watched this missionary wife going down in her fur coat, swaying and others. That night, someone was hit by the train that she was travelling into Laird Hungarian. When she tried to stop the bleeding, she was only with medical expertise on the, on the train. She put her coat around that poor man. It was so soaked with blood, it was never fit to be cleaned again. And so, but he, they brought this little coat back to their father and said, is this your son's coat? Not, is this our brother's coat? No, is this your son's coat? Broke his heart. Whenever you've got these kind of thoughts of bitterness and anger and hatred against other people, you will not care who, who gets hurt. And you can see this in their reaction to their father. They just wanted rid of a problem. Hatred always brings casualties. I know I have hated, even as a Christian, even as a missionary, I have let the Lord down. I have went after a preacher once I put gloves on and I was going to beat the tar out of him. I'm not a nice person sometimes. <laughs> and he lied to me. He lied. But I took his word. 25 years later, a man told me that he was with him in the meetings that he was holding at that time. He said, halfway through that meeting, the Holy Spirit left us. And in all these years, he's never come back. If that man had taken a beating tonight, that night and told the truth, maybe he would have been in a better place. Maybe he wouldn't have got a beating at all. But these are solemn things. It is a solemn thing to play around with God and then to lie and cover it. I believe that with all my heart. And the people that God brought into his life were amazing. Some of them were positive, some of them were negative. One of them was Potiphar who bought him. And in no time at all, because God was with him, he was given the rule of his whole house. Mm-hmm. Then there's a pretty grubby story where Potiphar's lonely wife bored out of her eyeballs. Ah, look at that good looking young fella in my house. She had all her plans made out. Joseph wasn't interested. He didn't play ball because no matter what, not only that he was the boss's wife, no matter what was going on, God was always going to be watching. The day came whenever she actually attacked him, grabbed him. Who's going to believe it? It was a slave that actually perpet- you know, perpetrated the whole deed. No. I think in some ways, though, when she came to her husband with his coat and said, He tried to rape me. That slave you brought into my house. Normally, he would have got that been finished. No way would he have got off of that. But no, he was set in prison. Sometimes there's just a little ring of untruth that leaves you feeling, "Uh -uh, don't really swallow this one. And so 
when he was in prison. Again, what was the key word that came with him? The Lord was with Joseph. And in no time at all, he's in charge. And then along comes, I'm skipping through this too, too quickly, but these two men came in. They were relatively important, a butler and a baker, and they were from Pharaoh's palace. And as they talk with Joseph, as they're talking with each other, Joseph sees there's something around there down. And he starts to talk with them. And then they explain, well, we're on the sentence of death. He thinks that we're plotting to kill him. And he says, Butler, you're going to be okay. He's going to reinstate you. You, job. (laughs) Sometimes when you're working for God, you have to say loving things, encouraging things, uplifting things to people. Sometimes you have to be hard and brutal with the truth. When you know what God wants you to say. You need honesty and you need courage. There's no point having one without the other. You need both. You need to be willing to step out of them and do and say what God says to you. And it went exactly like Joseph had said. And the butler left to go back to the palace. And Joseph said, it seems like there were some that this man in particular, he got set free. So it happened occasionally. Joseph said, would you have a wee word in Pharaoh's ear and tell him that, you know, this is the guy back there and he's innocent. Yep, I knew that. <laughs> you ever promised to do something for somebody and then sort of forgot? Mm-hmm. Or you got happy and you got involved in your own life and you forgot? <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened with Joseph for two more years. But then the purposes that God wrought through his life. Back home in Israel, or Canaan as it was known then, how much training could this man have learned? There were lessons that he needed to learn in Potiphar's house, in the caretaking of those prisoners, and then the next leg of the journey that he would never learn anywhere else. Egypt at that time was probably the key civilization in the world. And God was going to make sure that his servant got all that was necessary for making him the man he needed to be. He will do the same for you. Man or woman, he wants you to be the person that he can use. And so whenever they were, two years I think passes, and then Pharaoh has a dream. And he orders his magicians to come and tell him what his dream means. And suddenly the butler oh, dear me. You see, God knew right at the beginning that Joseph's dreams were going to get him into trouble. And he also knew that later on other people's dreams were going to get him out of trouble. But not instantaneously. And so the butlers and the bakers was all sorted out. And then Pharaoh's. And he turns to Pharaoh who's carrying the wine. Obviously someone in a position of trust to make sure there wasn't poison and all this. And he said, I remember I made a promise two years ago. There's this guy in prison and he can interpret dreams. <laughs> Bring him here. <laughs> Pharaoh wasn't hanging around. He won't know what his dream, his dream, dream meant. And so Joseph going through Potiphar's house, landing in prison, learning all these lessons, is suddenly brought into the presence of Pharaoh. He explains to Pharaoh what the dream means. And then he suggests, if you get a certain kind of a man, let him have the responsibility of this, 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 and make sure that you're prepared for the seven years of famine that are coming. You're going to have seven years of good. And Pharaoh thought, where am I going to get a man as dependable? Right, got the job. And there you see, Joseph is taken from the pit to the prison to the palace. Just like that. We've got all our ideas of what God's going to do, how he's going to do. What he has done with me, through me, the places he's brought me, I would never in a million years have guessed that. And yet in some of the most backward places, dangerous places, unbelievable events, God has shown me he's still in control. Now you've only got a quarter of my, my message, but 
the rest of it about the brothers coming and Joseph testing them and all the rest of it. You don't need that. What you need to know is that the Lord was with Joseph. What you're bound to know is that he has promised you, I will <coughs> never leave you. He won't ever leave you. God bless. And I've got one story. It's not about us. It's about a missionary. I read it some time back. And it spoke to my heart. A man called David and his wife stay. And as soon as I finish this, you're free to go. Or you can sing, or you can say, oh, there's no problem, and I'm not in a hurry, either or both. They came down from Sweden. They were called by God to go to the Belgian Congo. They came down with a family called the Ericsons. And when they eventually got through their language study, came to the Congo, and were heading to the village that they were going to be working in, the village chief said, ah, you're not coming into our village. Made them stay up the road about half a mile outside the village. No contact. Wasn't allowed. One little boy was allowed to go each day and bring them milk and eggs. And so he, David was like, oh, this is awful. We came here to a mission and we can't. Stay said, there's only one of them allowed to contact us. We need to see him saved. And the years passed. Sve became pregnant. Little child came. Sve lived 17 days after the baby was born. As David was digging the grave for his wife, something snapped. He turned around and he gave his little daughter away to the Ericsons. And he went home, blaming God for everything. The Ericsons, both of them lived eight months and died. Another family took that little girl. They changed her name to Aggie. They looked after her for three years and then brought her home to America. Years passed and this little girl doesn't know much about where she came from, much about it at all. She grows up. She actually goes to Bible school. In Bible school, she meets a friend, get married, they have two kids. Years passed, and one day, by accident, I love that wee word, by accident, a Swedish magazine is dropped through her door. She can't read Swedish. She's basically an American child now. But as she opens it up, she sees a headstone. And there's a name called Svea Flood. The name of her mother. And she said, what's going on? And she finds a place where there are a number of Swedish people. And she goes and says, what's this saying? It's all in Swedish, I don't understand. But I know this name. Have any of you heard this story? You have. You want to come up and tell it? <laughs> and so they listen. Or she explains, these people explain that this is a missionary lady who went out from Sweden and she led one person to the Lord. This one person grew up, got an education, came back to the village and built a school. At that school he led every child to the Lord and they in turn led mums and dads, brought them all to school and every <coughs> member of the family, every member of the village over 600 of them became Christians. And so she was absolutely ecstatic. And they made inquiries and discovered that her daddy had gone back to Sweden. He was still alive. The church said, would you like to go and see your daddy? She said, I would love to. She went back to find her daddy. And this man, he was actually an absolute rogue. He was a drunk. He was a derelict. He had remarried. He had four kids. The one command he had in his house, don't ever mention the name of God. Not in my house. Bitterness was still pounding out of him. And his daughter came to the door. And at the start, he was very, very unhappy to see her. And she said, Dad, it wasn't wasted. 
and told the story of how this one boy had been able to win the whole village for Jesus. That's what you went there to do and it's happened. It took a long time, several weeks. And the father came back to Jesus. And it was awesome. And just shortly after that he went out into eternity. It wasn't wasted. But yet only for that little time was he actually actively serving. His wife was already all these years in glory. But that little girl could tell him <clears throat> it God has blessed your work. And then years later she was invited to a conference in London. A man was preaching. <coughs> There were more than 100,000 baptized believers in his church group all over the country. Do you know who that man was? It was that little boy that Sphere had led to the Lord all those years earlier. And when they found out who she was, she went, she was paid by the church to go there. When they found out that this was Sphere's daughter, they said, you've got to come and see what happened because of your mum. And she was taken around all of those homes, carried on the shoulders of men from village to village to village because of her money. And she was loved where they couldn't love the mummy anymore. There's nothing wasted. God was with Joseph. God was with Sphere. God's with you. Your reputation in many places in Northern Ireland is amazing. You're known as a people who pray, a people who love, and a people who care. And we felt that from Stewartstown last year, specifically now with our son, the mission in Moran, so many times. I thank you. But this is only a wee bit out. There's so much more. Thanks for having us here tonight. Jim, would you close in a word of prayer? Or are you having another song? Okay. <clears throat> David, will you switch?